Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. Um, we're onto a very interesting one this week, Moonraker, which is the most loosely uh, adapted Bond novel that I've read so far. And knowing that going in, I was very excited to read a Fleming work that was relatively unspoiled to me. Fleming's Moonraker is set entirely in England, and more specifically, London and Kent. Uh, it begins with Bond being enlisted to investigate a Hugo Drax, a multi-millionaire businessman who M believes is cheating at cards. The thing is, Drax is also in charge of developing a nuclear missile, which Britain is counting on as a defense from enemies, and M doesn't want to cause a big scandal, so Drax is just shown up by Bond on a, on a small scale at M's club, where he is indeed rumbled as he is indeed cheating at cards. However, M has concerns, quite rightly, as to why Drax, a multimillionaire, would want to cheat for gambling money and suspects something more foul is afoot. This is confounded further when a Ministry of Supply Security officer so working on the Moonraker site, the Moonraker is the nuclear missile that Drax is developing as, as a defense, um, this particular agent is shot dead. Bond is then sent along to investigate and encounters Gala Brand, an officer from Special Branch working undercover as Drax's secretary. He also encounters shifty German moustached scientists and uh, an attempt on his life is made when a cliff he and Gala are relaxing under explodes. The pair, of course, survive, but come to discover that the Ministry of Supply officer was killed after witnessing a submarine near the coast where the Moonraker is being built. This leads to a further discovery that Drax is actually targeting London um, with the nuclear missile. Uh, so when it's due, it, the Moonraker is coming up to a, a test fire, and instead of being shot into a neutral area, just for as a demonstration purpose, Drax has actually set the coordinates for London. Of course, Bond and Brand thwart the villain who was planning on making a getaway in a Russian submarine. Uh, uh, the heroes retarget the missile into the English Channel, where the villain is making his escape on said submarine, and thus he is killed, along with more than just several of the innocent people. I, I mean, quite a lot of quite innocent people die in this finale, and presumably the you know. A good chunk of the southeast coast of England is radiated for the next few decades. The novel ends with Bond getting a pat on the back from M and expecting to go on a holiday with Gala, but it turns out Bond should have really paid attention to her shirking his advances as she is already engaged to someone else, uh, and we end with Bond seemingly heartbroken, or certainly lovelorn at the very least. I skirted over a lot of details there, but I will say there are some bloody great passages in this book. Bond and Gala have to endure some really brutal bits of torture, uh, and those scenes are written in such agonizing detail, you can feel the heat from the rocket yourself when they're hiding in vents and all this kind of stuff. Um, I love how the novel starts with Bond doing a personal favor for M. It's cool seeing the two of them out together, you know, not on official business, and I think the gambling scene with Drax is more tense and entertaining than you know, even the similar gambling scenes in Casino Royale. I love the whole start of this book. It's really fabulous. It's not just Bond goes into M's office and gets, you know, a mission briefing. It, it just feels so naturally woven. The main story of the book and the little prelude with Bond and M just, you know, investigating Drax for their own benefit. I know there was some criticism at the time about Fleming's choice to set the whole of the story in England, um, after people had become used to Bond, you know, he's a jet setter, he travels around quite a bit, um, but I actually prefer that the story is all contained within England. Maybe it's just coming after Live and Let Die, but this feels a lot less like Fleming's travel diary retrofitted into a story, if you know what I mean. It's also a lot less disdainful, as Fleming clearly likes England, uh, you know, he loves it a hell of a lot, and certainly more than Americans, who he can't help but just disparage throughout, you know, every book that Bond is there, apparently. I have issues with the ending, for sure. I mean, Bond saves London, no question about that, but several hundred people die as a result of his actions. I mean, yes, some of them are villains, but mostly innocent individuals, and combine that with the fact that a nuclear device was detonated near the south coast of England, like literally just off of the coast. I mean, maybe it's for the best that Bond and Gala didn't get together. I mean, after being near that, you know, explosion, their bodies could be so radiated that if they were to procreate, they would you know, birth a whole race of atomic supermen. 
it just makes the end of the story just so kind of like weird. I mean, I, I get it. Fleming rationalizes it as well. Better a few hundred people in the sea than all of those millions in London. And yes, logically Bond made the right decision in that regard. But it's just how casually and nonchalantly it's wrapped up with M. And M's just like, yeah, well, you know, a BBC reporter died and some other people. But don't worry, we're going to cover it up. Uh, why don't you go on holiday and take some nice piece of ass with you? It should make for more of a bittersweet ending, you would think. But that only really comes when Bond is jilted by Gala. Speaking of Bond, how is our favourite super spy in his third literary adventure? Well, better than ever in my estimation. He feels like a fully rounded character here. Maybe that's because more page space can be devoted to character instead of rambling descriptions about a place that Fleming visited or a conversation he overheard or a bit of mildly interesting anecdotal evidence. Um, because we're set in England this time, so of course we don't need to have passages and passages of, you know, what Fleming interprets the local people of sounding like, or some legend he heard about from a friend or whatever. The book starts with Bond off mission, and allows for some interesting insights into his personal life, what his job is like when he's not abroad, what he does with his spare time. There's great detail in here that, as a Bond fan, I really appreciate. I think there's a really interesting bit where Bond is about to go and face Drax on the card table, um, towards the start of the of the story where he's very insistent on taking a very specific amount of alcohol uh, as well as some benzodrine and amphetamine pills before he plays. It's a really curious scene and I guess it says a lot about Fleming because you'd think that you'd want a clear head if you were going to do some high stakes gambling but no, Bond gets merry and high before he does it and it's very much presented as a ritual. He presumably does this quite a lot. But one of the more notable aspects of the story, I find, is how Bond interacts with Gala, what he wants from her, and how he reacts when he finds out she's already engaged to another man. I don't necessarily think that Bond falls in love with Gala at all, but I think there's an underlying sadness to the relationship because Bond is clearly looking to have some kind of companionship, and he wants to eventually fall in love. He wants that. Vesper isn't mentioned explicitly, but I think her shadow remains lingering over him here. He wants that same thing that he had with her, and thinks he can maybe get it with Gala. But she, like, shows little to no romantic interest in him at all. Um, he thinks that she's a bit frigid, and maybe that makes him like her more. It's just something that we never really see in the cinematic Bond universe, um, unless it's with Vesper or Tracy. It's a sign of Bond that I appreciate seeing, and it somewhat humanizes him more. I really like it. So speaking of Gala, how does she fare when we compare her to the other uh, girls we've been introduced to in the book series so far? She's cold and a little aloof and very wooden, and I just get the sense that Fleming can't really write compelling female characters. Um, but Gala does come across as tougher than her counterparts so far. There are actually whole passages written from her perspective, um, and, you know, she's kidnapped and she's tortured by Drax, and we follow her through all of that, which is very interesting. Um, she's just not very compelling, but as a figure to explore Bond's romantic desires and a companion for the mission, she could be a lot worse. And then we have our villain, Hugo Drax, who is by far my favourite Bond villain of the novels so far. He's kind of classically ugly and deformed with strange features and proportions and bad teeth and scars and my favourite part, his big hairy ginger face that Fleming loves to mention at least once a chapter. Um, like literally, you'll be reading a passage and he'll be like, and the great big hairy face looked Bond in the eye and he just loves talking about it. Um, so he's totally different from the movie version, of course, um, Hugo Drax. He's quite brash, actually, and yeah, you know, I couldn't help but imagine um, Michael Lonsdale's face, but just with like, you know, like old school, like, uh, werewolf, wolfman prosthetics on it. That's just the image that I have of Hugo Drax, like big orange sort of wolfman with Michael Lonsdale's face. Drax has a really interesting history, uh, a former German national who was able to reshape and rebrand himself as an Englishman, and he went on to find success in big business, and of course he's hell-bent on revenge against Mother England for World War II. He and Bond have some good spats and banter. Uh, indeed, Bond seems to be quite impressed with the guy at first, despite him cheating on cards. 
both him and Emma like, God, he's a great big hairy faced cheating bastard, but he did build that devastating weapon of destruction, so how bad can he be? And indeed, I think it says a lot about Fleming and I suppose of the time that so much lip service is given to how Drax's missile is such a great accomplishment, and how it's unfathomable that someone who conceived of creating something that would instantly eradicate millions of people from the face of the earth could possibly be bad. I love how much of M we get in this story. He feels like a fully fledged supporting character for once. He spends a lot of time with Bond at the start of the book as they head to his gentleman's club, Blades, to ruffle Drax's feathers. It's just so cool to see him off duty and how he behaves when he's out in public and what him and Bond are like out of the office context. It's still impossible to imagine anyone but Bernard Lee when reading M. I'm really having a new appreciation for that particular casting. I can't think of any other actor who was of a similar age uh, uh, and around that time, you know, 1962, who could have embodied that character any better. It's just perfect casting. This is a really hard one, as the book has such little in common with its motion picture namesake. I mean, heck, aside from featuring a villain named Drax and a female agent undercover in the villain's organization in a scene where Bond and the girl are trapped underneath a rocket's exhaust and need to escape, I'm at a loss to find any other similarities. Um, not even just in Moonraker, but indeed in the whole of the cinematic Bond canon. I guess it's unfair to make a comparison, and you know what, Moonraker is one of my very favorite Roger Moore Bond adventures and a cracking bit of entertainment, but the book is just so much damn fun that if I had to pick between the two, I'd probably pick the book. I love this book that much. Interestingly, the film that Moonraker has the most in common with is probably Die Another Day, in as much as the idea of a villain reinventing himself and using an invention supposedly made for good uh, of humanity against it. You know, uh, Drax has the Moonraker missile, Gustav Graves has his, you know, um, big satellite up in the sky. They're very similar. Indeed, Miranda Frost from Dino the Day was originally called Gala Brand in earlier versions of the script for, for that film. Um, they changed the name eventually because they felt that the character in the film was so much more different from the character in the book, but I find that a bit of a shame, really. I'd have appreciated the nod. Um, but I guess the characters are so wildly different that it would have been Gala in name only, and obviously I would pick Fleming's Moonraker over the film Dino the Day any day of the week, so book wins out over both of its, um, you know, cinematic cousins, in my mind. Well, you know, much like the Moonraker went in search of his, you know, dream of gold, I went into this book series read-through in search of Fleming gold, and by gum did I find it in Moonraker. It is quite easily my favourite of the Pond books I've read so far. Everything works so well in this story. There's just enough intrigue, just enough action. Um, I was disappointed every time I had to put the book down, um, you, you know, when I was getting off the tube or whatever, and eagerly anticipated every new chapter. I really did kind of plough through this one. Um, highly recommended, thoroughly enjoyable read. Love it, love it, love it. Best of the series so far. And you know, after the disappointment of Live and Let Die, I'm actually quite galvanized to get, you know, reading even more of these. Um, so let's hope that Diamonds Are Forever, the next book in the series, lives up to its immediate predecessor. Until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.